Good morning, everyone. For those of you who would like a copy of the text, if you don't have a copy, there's chapter 3 of section 1. Um, and here's just a handout. For those of you who are watching in uh, Facebook land, if you go to the group Shiur in Morena Vuchim, you will find a JPEG file that you can easily download and just have the handout. Now, to get our bearings, to remind ourselves what the Rambam's objective is, if you remember from the Hakdama, from the introduction, he had said that my objective is to define certain terminologies that appear in the, in the Tanakh to help us better understand what Hashem was communicating to us in the Torah. The first, certainly the first part, is dedicated to removing any sense of corporeality or physical nature to the divine. And that's what we've seen in the first two chapters. Chapter three is a continuation of this objective of any time the Rambam says that we encounter terminology in the Torah that seems to attribute some kind of physical feature to the Rabbanu Shalom, we have to carefully redefine what we mean. And here we're going to be talking about the way people apprehend or intellectually cognize God. Because if people were to be able to see some kind of physical form to the Ribbonu Shalolam, that would also be problematic. And so therefore, in chapter 3 and the following chapter, chapter 4, the Rambam is going to address that particular issue. So, we talked about before the idea of man being created in God's image. And in image, we meant that it means that it's man possesses an intellect, not that man possesses any physical uh, similarity to the Ribbonu Shalolam. So chapter 3 now says, let's define two other terms that we find in the Torah that are Tavnit and Temuna. Those are two words that are sometimes used interchangeably, but, says the Rambam, we're only going to find the word Temuna in reference to God, but we will never find the word Tavnit in reference to God. So this, this is what he's setting out to do, because the word tavnit, as we'll see in just a minute, implies some kind of physical feature, and the word temuna is ambiguous. Sometimes it can imply a physical feature, and sometimes it can imply something much deeper. So we go to the text. It is thought that in the Hebrew language, the meanings of the words temuna and tavnit, which uh, the Pines translates as figure and shape, are identical. This is not the case. For tavnis is a term deriving from the word bana, and it signifies the build and aspect of a thing. I mean to say its shape. For instance, it's being a square, a circle, a triangle, or some other shape. And so essentially what the word tavnis means, it is descriptive of an external physical feature that describes the shape, the form of an object. So that's the um, so that's the uh, that's the, the that's what the word tavnis means. Accordingly, it says the shape of the tabernacle and the shape of all its, of all of its vessels, the tavnis kol, the tavnit kol kelav, and the tavnit of all of the vessels. Here the Torah wants to tell you that when the Jewish people constructed the Mishkan and all of its vessels, they all conformed to a specific shape and size. And it says, according to the shape that was shown upon the, the mountain. Again, referring to Ketav Nitam Asher Atam or Ebahar, the shape of the way things were supposed to be built, you were shown on the mountain. Okay? Meaning that uh, all of the instruments of the Mishkan, all of the accoutrements, all of the structure, all of the beams, all of the, uh, uh, the utensils, you were shown that on the mountain at Har Sinai. Uh, the shape of any bird, the shape of a hand, the shape of the porch, all of these words, all of these psukim contain the word tavnit. And all these passages, the word means shape, the physical shape. For the reason the Hebrew language does not use this word with reference to attributes that apply in any way, to the deity. You will never find the word tavnit in reference to the Ribbonu Shalolam. Now, here is where we get into the confusion between the word tavnit and temuna. So before we get to this 
uh, next paragraph, the last paragraph of the chapter, take a look at the psukim in source number one. This is from Parshas Va'et Hanan in Sefer Devarim in the book of Deuteronomy. And here the Torah says, V'nishmartem ma'od l'nafshotechem. You need to be very careful for your souls. And here the Torah is saying, you know why you need to be careful for your souls? Because idolatry is a very seductive practice. Because um, you may be tempted to worship idols in the same way that the other nations do, and in the way that you were raised when you uh, were growing up in Egypt. But note that you did not see any temuna. Here the word is not tavnit, but rather it is the word temuna. You did not see any temuna on the day that God spoke to you from within the fire. Now here the word, we're not sure what the word temuna means yet, but you'll see that the word temuna and tavnit seem to be used interchangeably in this whole passage. You look at the next pasuk, pasuk tet zayin, pentash chitun, Va'asisem lachem pesel timunat kol samel, tavnit zachar onikeva. Maybe you'll become corrupt and you'll make for yourselves a graven image, which is a timuna, a timuna of any samel, the, the, um, a sculpture image in any likeness. Tavnit zachar onikeva, the tavnit of a male or female. So the word timuna of any likeness, kol samel, and then tavnit zachar nekebad, the shape or the form of a male or female. Tavnit kol behima asher ba'aretz, tavnit kol tzipor kanaf asher ta'uf ba'ashamayim, the form or the shape of any animal or of any bird that will fly in the heavens. Tavnit kol romes ba'adama, the tavnit of anything that creeps on the ground. Tavnit kol daga asher ba'mayim itachas la'aretz. So you find that the word tavnit is used primarily, but you, the word temuna also crept in there. So it's not clear what the difference between the two of them is. And here's where the Rambam says we have to appreciate that, like he said in the very introduction of the Mora, that there are some words that, the, that are, appear in Hebrew that have multiple uses depending upon the context. What Pines translates as amphibolous, which is a very unusual word, so we're trying to avoid that word. As for the term figure or tamuna, it is used amphibolously or ambiguously or in multiple ways in three <laughs> different senses. You can, this word can be used three different ways. It is used to designate the form of a thing outside the mind that is apprehended by the senses. I mean the shape and configuration of the thing. So the first way that tamuna is used is the same way that we would use the word tavnit. In this sense, tavnit and temuna can be used interchangeably because just like tavnit refers to the physical shape of something that I see with my eyes, so too the word temuna is something that I see with my eyes and I try to, in the context of idolatry, I try to replicate the temuna, that which I have seen with my eyes. That's one way that it can be used. Thus it says, and make you a graven image, the figure of any, and so on. For ye saw no figure. What we just read in Sefer <coughs> Devarim, you never saw a temuna. You never saw God assuming a physical form or shape. That's the word temuna. Okay, good. It is also, now here's the second use. It is also used to designate the imaginary form of an individual object existing in the imagination after the object of which it is the form is no longer manifest to the senses. Now, I just have to sort of just, as an aside, the Rambam speaks in very Aristotelian uh, ways, in the way that he describes epistemology, the way that the mind works. And the way that the mind works is that it contains images within a certain faculty within the mind, which Greek philosophy or, or medieval philosophy calls the imagination faculty, right? There's different faculties within the mind. So there's a faculty <coughs> of imagination. And the faculty of imagination is something that we'll discuss more as we go further into uh, medieval philosophy of the Rambam and others. But the idea here is, is that your mind can conjure images of things that it has already sensed in the outside world, and it creates those images and puts them in the mind. 
The reason why we can conceive of certain things that we have never seen before is because we take combinations of different things. That we, like I can imagine a dragon, even though I've never seen a dragon. You never watched Harry Potter? Well, okay, besides that, yes, CGI. But the, why can the makers of Harry Potter uh, uh, imagine a dragon? Because they know what a, a big reptile looks like and they know what wings look like, so they just, uh, like bat wings, so they take bat wings and they combine that with the body of a big reptile and you get a dragon. And that's the idea behind how the imagination can conjure certain images, but those images exist not in reality, but they exist in the mind. That's the terminology, okay? So the word tavnit can also be used in the second way to describe an image that is not in the real world or the outside world, but rather in the world of the mind, but does not exist in the real world. And he, the example for this is, thus it says, in thoughts from the visions of the night and so on, the conclusion of the dictum being, it stood still, but I could not discern the appearance thereof, a figure, a timuna, was before my eyes. What we're talking about in this passage is a passage from the fourth chapter of the book of Job, of Eov, and here, um, I believe it's Eliphaz, is responding to Eov's complaints about all of his suffering. And he was telling him that I had a dream in the middle of the night. And in my dream, I imagined a certain image. And that image was the image of an angel. That's really what he's describing. And the angel is telling him a message that a mortal can never be acquitted by God. A man cannot be cleared by his maker. And the point is that what, what, that what Eov's friend was trying to impart to him is that I saw an image of an angel communicating this divine knowledge to me. But there too, the word temuna in Pasuk Tesayin in chapter 4 of Job, it says, It was there right in front of me, but I could not recognize what it really was. Temuna l'neged enai. It was a form in, my, in, in front of me. It wasn't a physical form. I wasn't awake, but this was in my mind. And so therefore, the second usage of the word temuna is something that we conjure in our mind. And finally, but it's still an image. It's still an image, right. It's something that takes physical form in your mind. It has a physical visage in your mind. Does that mean if somebody was born blind that they could never have that kind of image? It seems that way, at least from this philosophical perspective, that you can only imagine in your imagination faculty things that you have seen or combinations of things that you have seen in the real world. It certainly seems that way. Okay, but now, so therefore, Eof's friend means a phantasm of the imagination that is before my eyes while in sleep. The term is also used to designate the true notion grasped by the intellect. And now we get to the third. And this, just to address your issue, Miriam, the third word, Timuna, can be referenced by a blind person as well because it refers to a, the grasping not of a physical visage or form or shape, but rather the true nature of the thing that is being imagined or cognized. Okay? It is with a view to this third meaning that the word Timuna is used with reference to God, may he be exalted. Thus it says... Usumunas Hashem Yabit, referring to Moshe Rabbeinu, that he saw the Timuna of Hashem. So the word Timuna should not be mistaken for the other terms of Timuna, which is making out the physical form of God, because God has no physical form. But rather, here when the word Timuna is used, it's referring to the true essence of God. The meaning and interpretation of this verse are he grasps the truth of God. End of chapter. Very short chapter. Okay, but now we just need to unpack just one or, one or two final things. First of all, what was, in what references this Pasuk stated, Utmunat Hashem Yabit, that Moshe Rabbeinu sees the Tamuna of God. This is where, if you remember, God is rebuking Aaron and Miriam for their speaking disparagingly of their brother. Um, and what Hashem was trying to communicate to Miriam and Aaron is that you don't understand Moshe's level of prophecy. His level of prophecy is very different from the way other prophets, including yourselves, prophesy. And one of the ways that Hashem was communicating that to them is by saying, Tumunat Hashem Yabit. 
he sees the real Timuna of God, whereas other prophets do not see the real Timuna of God. And the Rambam therefore codifies this in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, where he talks about the difference between Mosaic prophecy and the prophecy of other prophets. And this is in Rambam Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, the seventh chapter in Halacha Vav. All the things here, in, and this is in source number three in the handout, all of the things here and spoken is the path of prophecy for all prophets, first and last, except for Moses, our master, who was the master of all prophets. And here the Rambam details the way that Moshe prophesied differently from other prophets. One of the, the first and uh, well, well-known difference is that other prophets only could only prophesy while their physical senses were at rest, meaning while they were asleep. They were unconscious, and they had prophecy in an unconscious state. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu was capable of having a prophecy while in an awake state, both while his physical senses were engaged with the physical world, he could still have a prophecy and engage in the spiritual realm at the same time, which was, again, unique, sui generis, never, never happened before, never happened after. Um, and then he, t- he says uh, th- that another difference is that other prophets receive their prophecy through an intermediary, an angel, some kind of uh, go-between between God and the prophet. But Moshe Rabbeinu has no intermediary. And so like Chazal say that Moshe saw ba'aspaklar yahami'ira, that's Chazal's terminology, they say that Moshe had a clear lens vision of Hashem. And then you see the underlined portion of the text, which I underlined, and it is further said, and the tumunah of the Lord doth he behold, which is to say that there is no manner of parable, for he sees the matter in its clearness without riddle and without parable, which is, as the Torah testifies concerning him, even manifestly and not in dark speeches which is the bimar'ah, the lo bichidot, that Moshe can see very clearly through a very pane of clear pane of glass and not with riddles. He does not prophesy in dark speech, but by sight, for he sees the matter in its clearness. Very similar to what the Rambam is saying here. So that passage where Moshe wants to see God and he's putting the cleft. Very there. good. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm going in that direction, Miriam. You're, you're, you're going in the right path. So let me, just, let me just point this out, that there is an inherent, and what Miriam is just raising, is an inherent contradiction in the way that Moshe's prophecy is described. Because on the one hand, the Rambam, both here and in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, describes him as having absolute clarity of the truth of God. But if we look at the text of the Torah, we also see a little bit of hedging our bets over there because first God, when Moshe says, Harini na'at kvodecha, in Parshat ki tisa, Moshe says, show me your glory. Show me your real essence, Hashem. And Hashem says, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass over you, but ufanai lo yeira'u. But you cannot, no human being is capable of seeing my true face. Implying that you won't, you don't see. Well, not, well, you could say that's an anthropomorphism, which is what the Rambam would say. But the, the difficulty is that on the one hand, from this passage and from other passages in the Torah, the Torah says, panim el panim. God speaks to Moshe face to face. And there is an absolute clarity, with clear vision, without an intermediary, and without any darkness or riddles. And like the Rambam says, the true essence, the temuna of God. And yet... The Torah also seems to be implying that no human being is capable of that. So how do we reconcile that? The, the problem is also inherent in the Rambam, because when we get to the 37th chapter of Mora Nevuchim in the first book, the Rambam says the very same thing that the Torah says, that no human being is capable of ascertaining the truth of God's essence. So he directly contradicts himself. And the Abarbanel picks up on this, and he says, if you want to get a classic example of what the Rambam meant in his introduction when he said, I'm going to be contradicting myself, don't think I don't know what I'm doing, I totally know what I'm doing, and if you find any contradictions, it's because I'm setting you up to work it through, right? Um, that's a, this is an example of that. 
where here the Rambam says that tumuna means you get it totally and see the essence of the thing. And later on, the Rambam is going to say that no human being, including Moshe, was capable of that. So I want to, I want to show you a passage from the Malbim, and with this we're going to conclude. The, you have to say that what the Rambam means is that Moshe Rabbeinu's apprehension of, of God was higher than any other human being that ever lived or ever will live. It was with a clarity of vision that can be called a tumunah. However, even the word tumunah is not the actual essence of God, but only a representation of him that human beings are capable of grasping. But it is the highest representation of God that a human being is capable of grasping. And so if you take a look at the Malbim, it's part of a much longer commentary. The Malbim over here says it's, it's, in, it's in Sefer Shemot on the, in the 20th chapter in his commentary on the Ten Commandments. Uh, the, Ram, the Malbim writes as follows, Utumuna ein hatsura boletet rak shoka'at. When you, the word timuna is used by the Torah, now the Rambam does not say this, but the Malbim makes reference to the Rambam shortly. He says when the word timuna is used in, in the Torah, it refers to an illustration or an image of something that is sunken into the surface of whatever surface you're looking at. But it's not a protruding representation. It is a sunken represent, representation, a concave representation not a convex representation. What do we mean by that? So let's take a look. Lemashal, to illustrate. Let's say I take, um, you know, people would have on their rings, they would have uh, the family crest. <coughs> and what would they would do with it? It would be a three-dimensional uh, figure or, or kind of sculpture, little mini sculpture, <laughs> and then you would take a uh, hot heated wax, put it into the uh, wax, and you would create a sunken image of the protruding image that is in the in the ring. Okay, Tabaat Hamelech, Chotam Hamelech, exactly. Okay, Uvi Inyan Ze Amar Timuna Leneged Einai. And that's what the word timuna is descriptive of. So it's not the actual representation of what the essence of the thing is, but it's by comparison the difference between the, the sculpture that's on the ring versus the imprint that is made in the wax. So when we speak in spiritual terminology, in, in spiritual things, when we use the word timuna, the only thing that we're capable of grasping in the physical world is the imprint of the spiritual essence that leaves an imprint in the physical confines of man's mind. And that's what the Torah means when it says that Moshe could see the Timuna of Hashem. That Moshe Rabbeinu was capable of illustrating the very essence of God's intellect, but only as an imprint, not as the essence of the thing. And that's how Kabbalists explain what the concept of Tzimtzum is this idea of re God reducing himself in order to make room for a physical world. God is known as Ein Sof. He is infinite in his essence. And therefore, how is his presence detectable in a finite wor world? It is by analogy, God leaving his imprint, not his true essence, but his imprint that is created by a vacuum of his essence. And that's why it says that Moshe would see would be mabit at the tumuna. It doesn't mean it doesn't say yireh utmanat Hashem yireh. It doesn't say that he sees with his eyes the tumuna of Hashem, but rather yabit. And to be mabit at something is to have an intellectual cognition of that imprint. He says, you don't use the word tumuna in, the, in this definition with the verb ro'eh, you use it with the verb yabit. 
And that's why it says you never saw a tamuna of God, because God's tamuna cannot be seen, it can only be cognized in the mind. And then he says, So the Malbim himself acknowledges that what he's doing is sort of moving forward the explanation of the Rambam. Okay, I think this is a good place to hold it. Any questions or comments? Nothing. Okay, we'll we'll fit, we'll we'll continue with. Uh, yes. So earlier, did we not say that Rambam said that the greatest thing is for us to to know God, to to imitate God, to to, to understand God's intellect? Like there's there's that element that we need. To, that that's what we're trying to. Um, Right, right. Ultimately, the goal of man is to make his intellect as unified with God's intellect as possible. And Moshe was as close to that as possible for right. a human being. Right. So to what extent did Moshe go beyond teaching us the giver of the law, which is very, it's not about essences, it's about very practical things, shatnes, hashrut, and things like that. And to what extent did he say, I'm the greatest master of this, let me disseminate it amongst the people? Because I don't think you see that in the text. You see him as the lawgiver, not the giver of philosophy. And Correct. It's, it's a very interesting point. First of all, it's important to know that the reason why Moshe had this higher level of prophecy was, was only for one purpose, because he had to be the giver of the law. If Moshe had not been the giver of the law, as great as he was, he would not have achieved the prophecy any greater than Avram, Yitzchak, or Yaakov. But it was specifically because the giver of the law needs to clearly understand the words of God without any personal intermingling of his own, um, of his own mental capacity. It's got to be, he has to view himself as a clear filter that just presents Hashem's information. So it's for that reason that he has this clear clarity of prophecy unlike any other prophet. The second point is, and that we'll talk, maybe this is not the time, but People who are prophets are sent on specific tasks or missions. Moshe knew what his task was, and the fact that he was able to apprehend far more than he communicated is very typical of prophets. Prophets do not share everything that they cognize. That's not their function. Um, and so I'm going to hold that idea here, and this will be an opportunity for us to talk about it further some later date. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.